Don't dislocate your arm patting yourself on the back. Hello there, Sir from 17 once again. This is my Darksiders 3 Apocalyptic Difficulty video walkthrough. I am going to be playing a strength build exclusively where I level absolutely nothing but strength and by the end of the game I will have something like 63 strength. I will be level 1 in HP, level 1 in arcane counters and that's the build that I'm going to be carrying through the game. Uh, I do this more so for fun, but also for efficiency. Uh, my logic is thus. If you go for HP, you are going to do less damage, but you're going to be able to take more damage. Uh, instead of that path, I can squeeze out more damage by not getting hit. Uh, however, not getting hit in this game can be a bit of a work of art, as you'll find out when you play. And arcane counters uh, are quite an interesting contradiction. In this video game, when you do a perfect dodge, it will slow the game down and afterwards you can press either of the attack buttons when you get the new weapons and you will repost doing an arcane counter. The standard arcane counter with the barbs of scorn, which is the whip that Fury uses the character you play as, uh, it does a move that scales on arcane damage. Additionally, your ability when you go into havoc mode, your crazy demon form, also scales with arcane damage. So if you were to level that statistic upwards, you can indeed make that do a lot more damage and make it more viable. But the problem is, it will actually hurt you in the long run unless you exclusively go for that. And it will force you into a playstyle that will dictate you need to get perfect dodges in order to punish things. And the problem with this is, you don't get any invincibility frames when you use perfect counters. So you can take damage while doing them. You can actually get hurt by bosses and enemies as by doing these perfect techniques because they don't function very well. And they're also quite slow. And then the damage that they do in the long run isn't enough to dictate the difficulty it will sometimes be getting them. So in my opinion, strength is the best statistic purely because all you have to do is press square. If you press square or if you press X, you'll do a whip attack and it will do more damage than you would if you perfectly counted something and did an arcane attack. And by the end of this game, I will be doing several times the damage that my arcane attacks could ever dream of doing. And it just compounds in much more damage, much more efficiency and uh, a little bit more expediency. But here is the first boss, Envy. Resentment made flesh. This boss has three techniques. It has the swipe that you just saw then. It has a thrust after the swipe where it can leave a shockwave on the ground that explodes. And then it has the jumping stomp. That's it. It's kind of a really bizarre boss. And I, I do think that the beginning of this game is really weak and a bad first impression. Which I'm going to talk about later. But the good news is this can introduce you to the concept of a couple of the different systems. Like how terrible Fury's double jump is. Quite possibly the worst double jump in the history of video games. It makes me laugh every time I see that stupid corkscrew that gives you absolutely no height. And then this really wonky looking whip swing technique that the game utilizes a lot that I'll talk about at length. But just jump towards the boss, knock it out of the sky and then proceed to combo it. If you want to use your wrath meter by pressing both bumpers, you can do a move that does decent damage and will make you invincible for the activation of it. And I'm going to use it later on to get through one of this boss's attacks. I'm also going to be dodging these moves a little bit early because I don't want to do the arcane counters to give you an example of what the fight looks like without them because the last time I did this, the arcane counters at this very first fight because we're only level 1 or level 3, whatever it is are actually really viable because they do the most damage you can do to the boss right now so if you want to kill this boss quicker than I'm doing arcane counters are the way to do it but once again, we're going to be repeating this really strangely procedural, very patient and uh, generous boss that waits here charging a spell so we can do this convenient platforming. And then we can go into a couple more hits. But the, the pattern's the same. It, it moves away from you. It'll do three shockwaves, so just jump over them. The third one is usually on you, very close, so just beware of that. And then combo the boss, wait for the sweep. And then repeat until crisis is resolved. And then after that, you're going to be into doing some forced walking sequences as we move through this ruined location. But I've trimmed that out so that you don't have to watch it. And now we're going to be doing our first piece of, of true traversal as I wait for Vulgrim to turn up. But he doesn't actually turn up in this part, so don't mess around here. So what is Apocalyptic Difficulty, you're probably wondering. Apocalyptic Difficulty is the hardest difficulty in the Darksiders franchise. Outside of the, uh, I think, De death Innative version, which added something higher. It generally means that the enemies do more damage. They might take a little bit more damage. Uh, the consensus is probably that they're a little bit more aggressive, perhaps. 
you know it's the standard difficulty tropes. I don't really spot too much that feels unique to this difficulty, in spite of the fact I've only played on Apocalyptic, but it seems like the standard difficulty, right? They do more damage, they uh, take more damage, and that's kind of, and they're a little bit more aggressive, and I think that's your bag. I don't think anything else will be effective. If it is, please feel free to leave a comment, guys, because once again, I, I just didn't notice if the prices in the shop are higher or anything like that, or if there's any new enemies somewhere, or any of those... The, the little nuances that can make a difficulty really interesting that this game just seemingly didn't do. But Apocalyptic is a tough difficulty at the beginning, because at the beginning Fury is incredibly susceptible to being killed in one to two hits, and then later on as you level her up she gets a lot more capable and the game kind of evens out a little bit. But one thing you're going to notice universally just on the game as a whole, regardless of difficulty, is that Fury dies fast and that the enemies do a lot of damage. Even towards the end of the game when you're really tanky and you've leveled HP a ton, you can still get 50% chunks taken off your life bar just by rough attacks. And you need to be aware of this. Uh, it's just the way the game is built. And then on top of that, the only checkpoints you get in this game are when you go to Vulgrim stations. So, there's one other exception to this, which is when you enter the, the Angel Realm, that doorway gives you a checkpoint for some reason. And I think you might even get one in the Hollow when you transfer between the Lord of the Hollows' realm. So any kind of teleportation, Vulgrim stations are pretty much the only time that you're going to be able to revive where you are. And this is going to lead to uh, occasional frustrations and absolutely batshit crazy, what were they thinking, why does this game hate the player and his fucking life? moments of runbacks that are preposterously stupid and awful. So, depending on how you feel about these things will depend on how it affects you, but personally I think the runbacks in this game are absolutely just unacceptable. Especially when you consider that Darksiders 1 and 2 had no problems like this because they were vastly superior games on that mechanical front, and I don't know why this game has reverted to this new style, because it doesn't suit the game. And You'll notice that right now there are a lot of negative reviews for Darksiders, and it does deserve a lot of negatives, but something that has to be said is that it also deserves a lot of positives. The game kind of vacillates between being good and being shit in equal measure, and as a whole, it's a decent game. It has moments of greatness and it has moments of just tepid frustration. If you can get past this new direction and this new design choice and the fact that the budget in this game and the polish is much lower than the previous two, you can have a lot of fun here. I will remember this game for the fun that I had, but I will always warn people that there were I was pissed off the entire time I was playing it because there's so many things in the game that don't work the way they should and that lead to player frustration that could have easily been changed but weren't doing so because instead they chose to pander to something they never were. And it's an interesting dialogue to have, isn't it? This idea that Darksiders is pandering to a different game because the entire franchise was built off of homaging better games. The first game was essentially a, com a combination of God of War and Zelda and done in its own styling and it was really good. I love Darksiders 1 a lot. The second game built on this, made it bigger, wider scope and then stole like the elements of something like Diablo and the loot grinding and all those systems and just built and built and built. Everything was bigger, vaster, there was more of it. Darksiders has made a name for itself by essentially stealing tech and doing it its own way, and making it fun. And this game decides to just completely parrot Dark Souls, and it removes all the fucking fun that the Zelda homaging and the God of War homaging gave it. And it makes no sense. It really doesn't, because character action games are precise, they're responsive, they're enjoyable, and they make you feel like a badass. Darksiders 1 and 2 had elements of character action, Lots of iframes, really fast and responsive dodging. The first game had a block that was so fucking good, it hurts my soul that it never came back. It was so good because it enabled you to block cancel and do all kinds of really interesting tech that I loved. You could parry cancel. It was so cool. There was so much complexity to something that was very quite... It was actually rather simple, but it enabled the player to take it that step further. Darksiders 2 became all about the crafting and making weapons that could pretty much make you invincible and all these insane setups of getting wrath and HP and critical chances and it just turned it into this almost this number grinding simulator that if you did it correctly you could be unkillable and then we come to this game and the entire game is just cheap shot central from enemies that do incredible damage a dodge that is so precise it reminds me of the fucking royal guard 
enemies that have active hitboxes and bad hitboxes that do all kinds of things to hit you and you don't really have the tools to, to get around it. And it feels bad. The combat has all these modifiers, but there's almost no reason to use them because it just seems florid and unnecessary. Half of the stuff you want to do is efficiency because if you don't, you'll just die in the animations. There are enemies in this game that have moves, that have such good tracking and such good startup frames that they will just frame advantage everything you do and it leads you to playing very utilitarian. You go into this Spartan mode of survival because if you don't, you're going to get hit. And then when you combine it with some of the, the hitboxes on Fury's whip where you just don't hit things when you're trying to hit them and they hit you, and then the fact that you can only take one or two hits, especially on Apocalyptic, it compounds in, instead of feeling like a very powerful, very capable character that can dance in and out of death scenarios and deal incredible damage, you feel like a, a pussy. A massive pussy that does no damage, hits things 50 times, and dies in one touch. And it's really cuckolding. And I, I, the, my favourite part was, someone on Twitter said to me that Fury's the weakest of the horsemen, so her lacking abilities kind of make sense. And all I can think of is when people say things like that, is just this whole idea that if you let the plot dictate how much fun your game is, you're gonna have a bad time. Like, Fury doesn't even have a fucking horse. How the hell can she be a horseman of the apocalypse when there's no horse, you know? And there's no horse because the game doesn't need a horse, so they kill it off conveniently, and then there's a bunch of like jokes at her behest. But the fundamental principle here is, you can't be a fucking horseman without a horse. So if we're going to get into this bizarre, wonderful, paradoxical universe of using the plot to dictate gameplay, we can't even have a game to begin with. <laughs> so it's crazy. But you might notice that the performance is a little bit stuttery, guys. You're going to see performance hiccups every so often in, in kind of weird places. I'm not entirely certain why. There are some moments where you feel like the frame rate should drop and it doesn't, and then there are other moments when it drops when you don't feel like it should. And I am playing this on the PC with everything on Epic, and I did notice that if you turn down the shadows, some of the areas that can give you those weird stutters still stutter, but they stutter less. And when I was researching online to see if it was just my machine not handling it very well because of my dated CPU and what have you, it turns out it's happening for a lot of people. The game just doesn't seem to run very well. Uh, so if you're wondering about your performance, it's probably not you. And when I was checking my setup when I was running it, my CPU never went above 70% when I was capturing. It seemed to be pretty intensive on uh, physical memory, so it's, it seems like a pretty heavy game on RAM. And because I only have, I think, 8GB of RAM, it put my uh, physical memory up to about 80%. But even still, like, I don't feel like there's anything in this game that should really be toiling my system too much. And I feel like the game just doesn't run that great. But... It never affected gameplay too much. There was almost no moment where I blamed frame rate fluctuating for anything that happened. So I can safely say that playing on PC at 1080p, 60 frames per second with the occasional stutters wasn't the worst experience in the world. I, I had a lot of fun with it and I never felt that it was a problem. Uh, if it had become a problem, I would say so, guys, because you know what I'm like. But that's kind of my mini overview of, of the game. I like to get that out on part one because a lot of people watch it and people ask me my opinion. So hopefully that's given you an idea. I'm going to go into the systems. I'm going to go into my, my opinions on all of the things that the game does well and the game does poorly in future videos on, on the interim moments between the fights because there's a lot of downtime in the game. So if you're looking forward to seeing more opinions or you're just curious why I've come to the conclusions that I have, I'm going to elucidate on those points and hopefully make it a little bit more clear. I can't fucking stand this, by the way. Whenever you're doing something and the game keeps interrupting it to show you that bollocks, the amount of times it's popped that stuff up on the screen and when I've come back to the game I've been slapped is too high, man. But before the video ends, I should really talk about some techniques that are going to help you because there might be people that watch this video and don't watch any of the other ones. So the first thing to recommend is if you hold the whip attack, which is square or X, depending on the system you're playing on, or something bizarre like right mouse click if you do the mouse and keyboard. When you hold attack with Fury, she will do a single hit into a bunch of horizontal swings. The horizontal swings will loop around yourself and they will hit a, a very wide vicinity. This is the move you want to use against groups. And if you continue to press the button or hold the button after you've started it, she'll do an extra bunch of swings and then she'll end it with a big overhead. Don't do the overhead, guys. 
When you're fighting a group of enemies, just hold the button until she twirls the whip and then dodge away from them. Hold the button, twirl the whip, dodge away. And then keep them in control and constantly flinching from the twirling of the whip. If you do the ender, it puts you in recovery frames that you'll have to dodge out of and you'll probably get hit afterwards. But whenever you deal with multiple enemies, that move is going to be your go-to technique. For one-on-one -on -one fights, the best move to do is the square, square, square. And if you do the timing deliberately, you'll do one whip, you'll do a come here like scorpion, and then she'll punch them into the air. And when you punch them into the air, it's a launch state that makes them hard knock down and have to stand back up, and then you can do the move again. And this move is really important, guys, because if you come up against enemies that have hyper armor, which are the most dangerous enemies in the game, they will ignore what you do to them. However, if you hit them when they're vulnerable, pull them towards you and knock them up, you can loop them and continually knock them down and they'll never get a chance to attack, they'll never get a chance to hyper armor through your moves and it is a consistent and guaranteed way to kill an enemy that's far stronger than you are. And I'm going to be using it for the Black Fiends that turn up, which are the stronger versions that give you resources. Those guys are going to be the ones that I show that technique for. And you might wonder, why don't you do the fourth hit, Chris, for the extra damage? And the reason is, it tends to stand the opponent up quicker. So if you hit them with the fourth hit, they can stand up and go into a hyper armor move, and then they'll hit through your attack, and it doesn't work. However, if you stick to three hits, you can keep them permanently stunned, and that's why I do it. On top of that, whenever you see me get a perfect evade, when it triggers the arcane input, I'm not going to do it. And if you see me do an arcane counter, guys, it means I made a mistake. And it leads me to a point that really frustrates me about this game. There's absolutely no way to turn off any kind of input move or technique. And this is something that developers really need to do. There are two moves in this game that I hate. The first one is the arcane attack, because all it does is ruin my damage potential. And then the second one is the dashing whip attack. When you dodge away from somebody and you try to do an attack, she does this overly long large recovery frame jumping swing that will get you hit. And I wish I could turn it off because there's absolutely no need for it and you could get two hits in for the time it takes to do that one hit. It doesn't help, it just gets in the way. But thank you so much for watching guys. Welcome to my apocalyptic walkthrough with level 1 HP and I hope I help and give you the advice that you need for the rest of the game. So, you take care now.